Thank you. Good morning. Um, first of all, I would like to thank all the Rainer team for the kind invitation to participate in that symposium. And my talk is about patient and surgeon experience with advanced IOLs. I have no conflict of interest to declare. That is my financial disclosure. And uh, talking about the visual needs of the patients, the, the first question is what is the plane the patients complain about? Usually patients complain, decreased visual acuity, decreased quality of vision, difficulties with the daily tasks, and finally, the decreased quality of life. Although the complaint is the same, it uh, affects differently depending on the age, the uh, refractive status, the activity, and it's clear that there is no single patient's profile. But uh, talking about uh, advanced IOL and premium surgery, I think it's very important to separate two different groups, the presbyopia patients and the cataract patients. Cataract patients usually complain problems to renew the driving license, uh, to driving at night, problems to sight sign well, to see the, number, the names of the street, all related with the distance vision difficulties. But in our practice, the main vision problem for cataract patients includes to the intermediate and near vision. Presbyopia patients only has one complaint, spectacular independence, and it's known that presbyopia starts symptomatic over 50 years old, and the surgical indication is different in emetropic presbyopia, that is patients with high expectation, than when refractive error is associated with presbyopia, that is high level of satisfaction. But in any case, the presbyopia surgery must be different than the cataract surgery. The second question is how can we know the real preoperative visual needs of our patients? A large number of questionnaires are available offering information about the functional limitation due to the cataracts, the impact of vision loss of the quality of life, the best time for cataract surgery, but in my opinion, one of the most easy to fill and one of the most useful is the CatQuest 9SF because only with nine questions can establish the real difficulties that the patient has to carry out of these daily activities to the, to the vision problems. Using the cat quest before and after surgery allows the patients to assess the visual function before and after surgery. And the most important, patients can compare itself how their daily activities have improved after surgery. Asking and obtaining all of that information, we can customize the IOL selection according to the patient's profile. From the trifocal to enhanced monofocal IOL, we can select the best choice uh, regarding the priority of patients. What priority is spectacular independence, we must achieve a real simultaneous vision and probably the best choice will be a trifocal IOL. But when the priority is the quality of vision or not this photopsia, the functional vision could be achieved using EDOF or enhanced monofocal IOL. But in all cases, the ultimate goal with advanced IOL is to achieve a real vision-related health value. And how can vision-related health value be measured? If we use only the clinical outcomes, like, like uh, visual acuity or contrast sensitivity, probably we obtain only information about the surgeon satisfaction. It's known that visual acuity is not the same as visual quality, and visual acuity and no complication not always seems satisfied patients. The patient's data is required is we want to obtain a real information about patient satisfaction. We need the perception of the improvement of worsening after surgery, that is the patient reported outcomes, and the personal experience with the surgery, that is the patient reported experience. We can collect all of data using different uh, digital platforms, and one of the most uh, easy to use is the Ray Pro, that offers the possibility to collect data provided directly by patients in a short questionnaire, and the most important, without the presence of the doctor or auxiliary personnel. That is a real anonymous questionnaire. The data collection sequence starts at the first week, asking only about satisfaction with surgeon and with the hospital, and a three-month 
includes the satisfaction with outcomes, the spectacle independence, and the world vision. And in the first year, includes the visual disturbance and the additional procedures required. It is the same for the two and the three years. And this is important to point out that surgeons cannot see the responses for individual patients. All data is aggregated. The results offer the real patient's perspective and can evaluate the quality of care offered by patients, the measure benefit of medical and health care with surgical treatment, and the assessment of the patient quality of life at each specific time. Data from PROMS and PREMS shows a patient's perceived overview of our practice. We, have, we can know the satisfaction with surgeon, with the hospital, with outcomes, the spectacle independence, the visual disturbance. And regarding the patient surgeon experience in premium surgery and advanced IOL, the satisfaction is achieved when the ratio between experience and expectation is over than one. And the question is, how can we improve the experience? The experience could be optimized measuring the previous and post-surgical visual function data, assessing the degree of patient satisfaction, and assessing the vision-related health value with premium surgery. And all of that only can be obtained through the PROMS, the PROMS, and the PREMS. And that, I think, is the uh, message uh, to go home. The, about the presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. The video of the Professor Piñero. Dear colleagues, it's a pleasure to be uh, here to talk about this topic, the difference between multifocal and standard range of vision IOL optics. Uh, sorry for not being there. Uh, I have some familiar issues and it was impossible for me to, to be there. Thank you, Rainer, for considering my participation. As all of you know, multifocality consists on the use of a corrective device that generates various foci to allow functional vision at two or more distances. This can be achieved by the use of a refractive element or by the use of a diffractive element or even the combination of both. Uh, currently available implants are mainly based on, a on the use of a diffractive element. Why? Because uh, this way we can achieve a wide range of pseudo accommodation and um, we can achieve it without a very, very significant degradation of the uh, optical quality. Currently available uh, multifocal diffractive uh, implants are based on the use in one of the two surfaces of the, of the lens of a multi-scale profile uh, that includes rings from the center to periphery. This allows a light distribution to two or three foci due to the uh, principles of, uh, of diffraction and the interference uh, between the, the diffractive patterns generated by these uh, steps. And the result is, a, is an IOL with a power that is the sum of the base lens power, which is the power uh, uh, required for this transmission, and the power of the diffraction orders. This light distribution generated by uh, the diffractive uh, elements, here you have an example of a bifocal uh, profile, it's dependent on several parameters defining the, in the optical design of, of the lens. And it's important to have in mind that this distribution is pupil independent. When there is a reduction of the pupil uh, diameter of the aperture, there is a reduction of the, uh, in general, of the light entering the eye uh, and reaching each foci. But the type of distribution between distance and near is not uh, modified. In the case of trifocal diffractive IOLs, uh, it can be achieved, as for example, by the combination of two bifocal diffractive profiles generating this uh, distribution to uh, the three different uh, uh, object points and uh, analoging this uh, visual function at, the, at these three different distances. Okay. 
this uh, multifocality achieved with uh, diffractive profiles can be modified if we uh, uh, generate a variation of the height of the steps, progressively reducing them from the center to periphery. Uh, this uh, way of, of working is called apodization, and this uh, uh, is the result of a phase profile modulation that uh, allows a, a, a pupil dependence of the relative energy distribution percentages. In the periphery, the steps are lower and send more energy to the distant focus and less to the near. And uh, when it's present a meiotic, a meiotic pupil or, or a very small aperture, the near focus energetically it's reinforced in compared to the to the far one. What is the problem of of all these uh, these designs? One of them is the generation of halos, the out focus secondary matrix in each focus, which is very dependent on IOL design and pupil size, but also uh, the uh, uh, impact of residual refraction, which is very relevant. It has been demonstrated the uh, great impact of residual astigmatism and high order aberrations with different models of uh, the refractive uh, uh, multifocal IOLs. It's important that uh, residual astigmatism of more than 0.75 diopters can generate a very significant visual impact or even uh, slow, low levels of residual spherical aberrations. It's important in different uh, uh, type of uh, simulation has been demonstrated, which are the main influential factors of the generation of this uh, photic phenomena with trifocal or, or, or bifocal diffractive IOLs. First is the diameter of the central illuminated sector of the IOL that contributes to near fo focus, the difference between the distance and near power, and even the distance and near uh, power. This is, uh, this is uh, simulated uh, without considering the effect of scattering and high order aberrations. This uh, leads to, to, to think if it could be better to generate an optical uh, device with no differentiated foci, because this could lead theoretically to a less uncomfortable photic phenomenon. This was the rationale for the benefit of theoretically extended depth of focus uh, IOLs. But one thing we have to consider, if we have a smaller halo size, it is necessarily better, because you have to think it, this halo would be more intense, because the light is concentrated on this, uh, this small area. This is the, as uh, I have stated before, this is the, the rationale for EDOF IOLs uh, to obtain a functional vision at various distance. A functional vision is a vision that allows you to perform different tasks, but not with the maximum level of visual quality. We can say that we have a, an acceptable level of vision quality for different distance, and we try to avoid this uh, differentiated foci, uh, because this way, theoretically, we will uh, avoid uh, or we will minimize uh, photic phenomena. Which is important to consider is the level of pseudo accommodation achieved to be more limited. It's important to have in, ma to, to, to have in mind the definition, the, the uh, globally accepted definition of EDOF IOLs. And it's important to know uh, that uh, an EDOF IOL needs to have at least 50% of eyes achieving monocular distance correct intermediate visual acuity of better than or equal to 2032 at 66 centimeters. There are several uh, optic uh, principles to achieve this uh, uh, this standard of the focus. One of them is the control induction of spherical aberration, also the control of chromatic aberration, and even the use of the pinhole effect, which is the basis for the ICA uh, uh, IOL. What we want is to increase the depth of focus, but it's important to uh, have in mind the real definition of depth of focus, because uh, when we talk in, uh, in, in our uh, field about uh, depth of focus, I think we are really referring to depth of field, which is an intrinsic phenomenon to any optical system, uh, 
defined by the distance between the nearest and farthest point in the object space that provide a focus image uh, in, the, in, in the retina. Therefore, if we are working in the object space, we have to call or, or we have to talk about depth of field, not depth of focus. Um, which is uh, this? Uh, the result of the depth of field is the uh, is defined according to the circle of minimum confusion and even the tolerable circle of confusion. The depth of focus is when we work at the uh, space image. There is the range of distances the focal plane can be moved with a blue ring image, and this is. Uh, important to, to have in mind when we talk about uh, this type of lenses. What factors can influence the depth of focus and depth of field? The circle of confusion, which is the criteria that we define uh, to, to know how strict we want to be uh, to define this uh, depth of focus. Therefore, this definition is, uh, uh, is uh, clearly uh, subjective because it depends on the criteria that you want to define, and not all people would uh, consider the, probably the same criteria. The object distance and even the diaphragm, the pupil, uh, all of you know that there is an improvement of the focus for the smaller. Uh, what is the ideal situation? The ideal situation would be uh, the balance between the level of pseudo-accommodation and photic phenomena. If we want to minimize halos, probably we have to talk more about functional vision and we don't have this level of uh, this uh, a wide range of uh, of distances uh, that we can have a good uh, vision. And the opposite, if we want a a, a full range of vision, uh, it's uh, inherently associated to uh, the presence of photo phenomena. This is important that you have in mind. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'm open to any questions that you have concerning these these issues. Thank you. Dr. Bilbao. Okay. Good afternoon, dear colleagues, dear chairman. Thank you very much to the RENA team and to the chairman of the symposium for, the, for this kind invitation. I'm going to present you our results with a trifocal Reiner lens. These are my financial disclosures. I have no financial interest in any of the products mentioned in the presentation. First of all, first of all I would like to thank you, Dr. Fernando and, and Andrea Jovet, because most of the results presented in, in, in this talk have been made with their extensive work during the last years in Clinica Baviera. Uh, I think there is among us a general consensus that nowadays trifocal lenses are the gold standard for presbyopia lens surgery with the pros and their cons. And it's a great advantage that Rana nowadays can offer these type of lenses for the full correction of presbyopia. Okay, so trifocal lenses are target for, for people willing to have a, um, a, a full correction of the presbyopia willing to accept the, the negative effect of diffractive lenses. Um, and among them, patients who have my, uh, less than one diopter of corneal astigmatism are the goal of our trifocal non-toric lens. Uh, there are one trifocal lens platform uh, has all these optical characteristics. It has a 16 diffractive rings uh, with a 4.5 millimeter diffractive zone and a monofocal zone in the outer of the lens to minimize hollows and glares related to diffractive steps. And the Rayner uh, trifocal technology is able to uh, have only an 11% uh, loss of vision. The lens displays a neutral aspheric aberration with a non-toric and a toric uh, optic platform. It has an optimized longitudinal chromatic aberration profile and uh, has a different diffractive order distribution in order to minimize the light loss, as I mentioned previously, and to improve the quality of vision in lower order disorders of diffraction. Of diffraction. 
Uh, in Clinica Baviera, we have a large experience with over 9,000 trifocal lenses implanted up to now. And these results have been presented extensively in different congresses. I'm just going to mention you very briefly. I don't want to bother you too much with too many numbers. This is a retrospective analysis of over 1,000 patients implanted bilaterally. Most of these patients have a, had a mild cataract or were uh, operated for, uh, for clear, lens, uh, clear lens extraction, refractive clear lens extraction. Patients had no other ocular problem and had no intraoperative or postoperative complication. And these are the, the main outcomes measured in the study. Regarding visual and refractive outcomes, uh, patients had a, a, an excellent binocular vision in the full range of distances with point, 0 0.9 logmar uh, for the near, 0 0.21 and 0 for the distance. Regarding safety and efficacy results, both of them were excellent with uh, having obtained a postoperative refractive state in the range of minus plus one diopter in 93.5 uh, percent of the patients. Regarding spectacle independence and, and, and patients' outcomes, uh, we perform a questionnaire, a personal questionnaire performed in Clinica Baviera, and we also use the CatQuest 9SF, and uh, the results were excellent. 99% of the patients didn't need any glasses for the driving, 99% also didn't need any glasses for the computer work, and for reading only 4% of patients needed extra glasses, whereas mm, virtually 6% of patients only referred important uh, problems with night vision, 2% did not report any difficulties during any day life activity, 98% of patients were satisfied with the clinical results, and 98% of patients were happy and would repeat the procedure. This is our large experience with what do the peer review papers say about this lens. Uh, there is especially three big major papers published with this, with this lens. This was the first comparative study performed by Dr. Dr. Ribeiro and Dr. Ferreira in uh, 2019, uh, comparing the uh, Reiner and the Fine Vision Pod F. Both lenses obtained very similar results in terms of visual acuities at all distances, obtaining uh, completely glasses independence, but having a best refractive target outcome with the Rhino lens. This second paper, also with the same group, added a third group of 15 patients implanted with a panoptic lens, and they did the same prospective comparison the results with the three lenses, RI1, Fine Vision Pod F, and Panoptics, were completely comparable in terms of vision at all distances. Um, and, and this last study by, the, by this Austrian group did a prospective bilateral study comparing the implantation of a Reiner trifocal, trifocal lens in one eye and a an, an LISA uh, trifocal in the second eye the results were comparable in both lenses with the better visual outcomes with the Reiner in the intermediate distance, but uh, slightly, very minimally, slightly worse results in terms of contrast sensitivity and this photopic phenomena. In summary, the Rai-1 trifocal diffractive lens provides an excellent and refractive and visual result at all distances, and this has been confirmed, first of all, by the patient's reports, referring excellent good visual quality scores with a very high level of spectacle independence and an excellent subjective satisfaction. And this has been confirmed by the peer-reviewed journals and with extensive studies in our clinical experience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bilbao. Dr. Bilbao has extensive experience in multifocal IOL in plant surgery, but which satisfaction questionnaire do you prefer? Um, we are very used to the questionnaire we, we, we use in Clinica Baviera, but I think the, CAS, the CatQuest is a very useful, a very simple, uh, as this was mentioned, I think, by uh, Alfonso in his good presentation. I think it's uh, probably the, the, 
the most useful compa uh, um, comparing the, the spent of time, the spent time uh, in its performing and, and the information we get about it. Okay. Um, what is your general presentation of the satisfaction of your patient with a spherical and toric trifocal IOL in general? Uh, you mean with, with all, all trifocal all lenses? The if you do a proper patient selection, I mean, if patients have no other ocular problem, and if patients know what they're going to, I mean, they, they're going to obtain an excellent quality of life, an excellent uh, vision at all distances, but they're also happy to accept that they're going to have some uh, contrast sensitivity loss and some photic phenomena, uh, the results are obviously excellent. It is, as it was mentioned before, a, di a big difference comparing patients who have previously a, a cataract, especially a dense cataract. In all these patients, the satisfaction is better, I think, uh, compared to most of our patients. We do a lot of uh, refractive lens surgery, and these patients usually are more um, demanding patients. But in both groups, if patients are well chosen and well informed about the final results, they tend to be quite happy about it. The first question. When do you have a patient when refractive corneal surgery? Mm -hmm. Why lens do you prefer? I think with uh, patients who have a, a previous laser ablation, the importance of what lens you're going to choose is especially important if you're dealing or if you're thinking you're going to implant a complex lens, such as a trifocal lens. So, if I have a patient who's been operated for myopia, the patient has a positive spherical aberration, I tend to use trifocal lenses with a more negative power. Whereas if, I, if patients have been done uh, hyperopic LASIK, then, then I, tend, I tend to choose patients with a, with a non-aspheric profile or with a more positive uh, corneal aberration, such as a rhino lens. Okay. It is important to choose and to select this properly. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Lucia Pelosini, please. Okay, so we talk about patient selection for uh, toric lenses with the Ray 1 toric lens. Um, so astigmatism, um, the incidence of significant corneal astigmatism is in less than 30% of the population. We will find more than one day opter of cylindrical um, corneal astigmatism. And then in 10% of these patients, the astigmatism will be higher than 2, 2.25. The main question is when, at what kind of threshold do we select a toric lens? And this choice will be also led and conditioned by the type of lens you are thinking about. So for the monofocal lenses, you probably have a slightly higher threshold, and for trifocal lenses, you will have a lower threshold. Why do we correct the astigmatism? We've already heard about this. Patients achieve a better and aided visual acuity and patient satisfaction is higher and the quality of vision is better. How do we assess our patient? I think this is one of the most important steps, correct patient selection. So to start, we want to offer toric lenses to an ideal patient with a regular corneal astigmatism. And in order to assess the cornea, you need a combination of biometry, topography with the anterior surface examination, and tomography to examine very well the posterior curvature of the cornea. It's very important to assess the ocular surface, the amount of dryness, because if you're dealing with someone with a bad ocular surface, your diagnostic platform will be unreliable, potentially leading to errors. The centration of scans is crucial, so you've got to work very closely with your technicians, optometrists in clinic, doing all the diagnostics and measuring, making sure that the tests um, in diagnostic stage are very accurate. The ideal patient will have a large pupil. This will help the implantation of the lens, but also post-op checks to check if the axis is correct and obviously exclude anyone with irregular, scarring, complex comorbidities and previous ocular history. Always, always check the other eye. I always remind the juniors and fellows learning about toric lenses, most of the time the other eye will give you very important information on, and will guide your decision on the first implant uh, better. First principle is that the astigmatism tends to change over time as we age. The posterior cornea becomes gradually steeper, and this will have an impact on the against-the-rule astigmatism. 
The most common astigmatism we see is the one with the rule, with the steep axis vertical, and, but the against the rule will increase over time, and also the incidence of oblique astigmatism will increase over time. So this is very important to keep in mind. Posterior astigmatism, very important to always assess this on the topography and tomography platform, because this will contribute to the against the rule astigmatism. The posterior cornea works like a minus lens. We need to know our own surgical-induced astigmatism and keep in mind where we like to sit on the operating table. And we know there are lots of papers reporting that the superior axis being closer to the center of the cornea has a higher impact on surgical-induced astigmatism. The temporal axis is better. And then <coughs> different practices apply to different surgeons. Some surgeons like to sit on axis. And if you are familiar with the ordering of toric lenses, one of the questions when we do the order is where we place our incision, and this is to uh, calculate the uh, surgically induced astigmatism. Enantiomorphism is also a very important principle. Most normal eyes uh, look like a mirror image. I always, again, repeat to juniors learning, it should look like two wings of a butterfly. Most of the time, if you're dealing with a normal cornea with a high astigmatism, the right and the left topography will be specular image. If it doesn't, you should examine the patient at the slit lamp and know very well the cornea and the previous history and understand what happened. So always examine the patient at the slit lamp, not just looking at the biometry topography and ordering the lens. So first case, we have a patient with a, scler with a cornea scar on the temporal side. You can see the right topography map has a steep island. This is an irregular astigmatism. We've got a red light do not implant a toric lens. Second patient has a flattened area on the left cornea. You can see a triangular patch where the um, topography has a blue island. Again, this is a pterygium. First of all, remove the pterygium, reassess the patient three to four months later, repeat biometry topography, and then decide if you, if you really have a more regular astigmatism worth implanting a toric lens, otherwise avoid toric lenses and know the previous history of the patient. So we're dealing with an 83-year-old male with irregular astigmatism, previous history of hepatic keratitis, and you can see that the right eye has a very high delta, 6.3 diopters, and there is a blue island of flattening on the topography, again, very irregular. Do not go for a toric lens. And this patient is a female with very dry ocular surface, dry eyes. So you have a patchy pentacam with irregular fragmented axes. Be very careful. Best to treat medically, treat the dry, dry eye and the ocular surface, bring the patient back in three months, reassess the need for a toric implant. The ideal candidate for a toric lens will be someone with, with the rule or against the rule astigmatism. So this is a beautiful example where you've got the steep axis vertically. And always be careful. Again, I always um, uh, uh, remind colleagues and juniors learning about this, don't look at glasses prescription, always look at biometry and topography. You look at the glasses prescription, there is a very low cylinder. You look at the topography, you have a high delta over 2.4. This is a patient who would benefit from a toric lens implant. And this is an against the rule astigmatism, 81 year old lady, where the steep axis is the horizontal axis. And this lady uh, underwent surgery with a three cylinder, three diopter cylinder at 180 degrees. Again, keep in mind the horizontal steep axis and the oblique astigmatism always needs slightly overcorrection. And when we're dealing with someone with a with rule astigmatism, we always slightly undercorrect. And this is an example of an oblique astigmatism, very high cylinder. And this patient had an eight diopter um, cylindrical lens on the right and seven um, cylinder on the left. But again, the benefit of treating this type of prescription is huge. And this patient, for the first time in their life, will be glasses free for distance. So the impact and the improvement in quality of life in their unaided visual acuity is, is, is exceptional. Ideally, we want to give toric monofocal lenses to patients with a regular cornea astigmatism, but sometimes we face patients with complex cornea history, keratoconus. In very few cases of keratoconus, if the cone is very central and the central axes are perpendicular, you may select a toric lens, but these are very, very few keratoconic patients. These are complex patients that need to be selected very carefully. 
Again, this patient had a very high astigmatism, and for the first time, glasses free could achieve 612 in the right eye and 69 in the left eye following a monofocal toric implant. But this is not the most common indication for toric lenses. And again, this is a patient post graft uh, penetrating keratoplasty with a very high cylinder on the pentacam. Uh, there is a 15 diopters on the right and an 18 diopter cylinder on the left. Now, there are no toric lenses reaching this type of correction, but we implanted a 10 diopter cylinder. And again, the result for this patient after keratoplasty was significantly impacting on their quality of life. Our experience, provisional data with the Ray-1 toric lenses, 56 patients, mean age 75. So, the smallest details make the biggest difference in final surgical outcome. Um, the Ray-1 lens, the cylindrical power is on the front surface of the lens, and the shape of the optics with the loop shape has a particular benefit in the stability, rotational stability of the lens. We want to avoid lens tilt, and ideally we don't want the lens to rotate after implantation. Now, in our uh, group of patients, we had no need to return to theater for any rotation. Um, the injector goes through a 2.2 millimeter in incision, and again, one of the first principles is never enlarge your incision before you put a toric lens. You don't want any instability of the anterior chamber or loss of fluid afterwards because that could compromise the stability of the lens. This injector can easily go through a 2.2 millimeter incision with no need to enlarge and then add suturing with vicro nylon. Um, patient, um, they had uh, the axial length distribution. The patient sample was mostly myopic with a mean uh, axial length of 24 millimeter. Spherical power from three diopter to 24. So those were mostly many, many myopic patients with a cylinder from one to six diopters. And we can see that the change in visual acuity pre-op is the orange and the post-op is blue. And you can see that the spread of unaided visual acuity is much more narrow. We had a few patients selecting uh, reading vision, minus 2.5 as or minus 2 as an outcome, myopic outcome. So we had a few in the 0 0.5 logma, but most patients were around 0 0.3. Change in the spherical refractive error. Again, you can see from the orange data pre-op to the blue data, you get much more narrow um, uh, spread around 0 0.5 minus or plus 0 0.5. And also the cylindrical power of the lenses, you can see from pre-op in the orange distribution to the post-op is much more narrow. So in conclusion, the toric IOL offer the best possible unaided visual acuity to these people um, who are, can be selected and suitable candidates with a regular corneal astigmatism. We improve their quality of life and the quality of vision. We had no return to theater, so the rotational stability of this type of lens is, is ex excellent. Um, and we always need to remember to use the diagnostic platform to assess the posterior cornea, tomography, topography, and no the surgical induced astigmatism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Pelosi, um, even today there are surgeons who prefer to correct astigmatism in cornea with corneal procedures. But at present, we consider the use of toric, is, of toric IOL to correct astigmatism. But and really, uh, what degree of astigmatism are they recommend for treat? Again, the threshold varies in different hands and also with different lenses. If we are using a monofocal lens, probably anything over 1.5, we can go down to one diopter of cylinder below one relaxing incision are reliable enough. But if um, we are using trifocal lenses, then our threshold can be slightly lower towards one diopter rather than 1.5. And trifocal or multifocal, one diopter. Yes. And monofocal, 1.5. You can go up to 1.5. In the national health system, the threshold is two 2.5 cylinder, which is quite high. Two diopters but of cylinder, 2.5. But all the companies. Monofocal yes. lenses, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Professor Aufar, please. Thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Reina, for organizing this nice symposium. 
Um, I will talk now about the EMV uh, optic design and first results also with the toric lens. Some of my disclosures. So you already heard that the uh, Ray One EMV and uh, um, monofocal and the EMV toric uh, can be delivered uh, with this very nice injector. And you can see here the power range is up to 30 diopters. And the cylinder is in 0.75 diopter increments, as you can see, going up to 4.5 diopters. And these are the whole family uh, of the Rayner uh, lenses. And you can have a decision tree uh, where you start. Uh, does the patient have a cataract or not? And which way you want to go uh, in order to decide what kind of lens you want to have at the end here, uh, if the patient has uh, some astigmatism uh, uh, and wants to have uh, maybe even some uh, uh, a good intermediate and near vision, you end up with a Ray-1 EMV toric, for example, and so on. So the, these kind of decision trees uh, are here, and um, we launched or we did the first uh, Ray-1 EMV toric uh, at the ESCRS last year. So what does the uh, uh, EMV does? It is a monofocal plus slash EDOF lens, uh, uh, which can give you up to 1.5 diopter with an emetropic target. But if you play with monovision, you can get further on that. High quality of vision, this is non-diffractive technology. Uh, so contrast sensitivity, dysphotopsia, and so on is, is not really an issue. And therefore, patient satisfaction is, is much better. They use a completely different design than a lot of the other companies are using. They create a positive spherical aberration on purpose, actually, to uh, provide uh, a smoother transition between distance and near eyes and get you a depth of focus. And this is also now available as a, as a rotational stable uh, Ray-1 toric lens. This specific uh, design of the haptics is very, very much uh, uh, rotational sta stable. We have uh, tested these lenses over the last 15 years because the basic design of these closed haptic uh, loops uh, has been advocated for quite a while uh, for stability, also for centration, actually, which is also important if you look at this. So when we look at this uh, design, you see here how um, <clears throat> the EMV, the positive spheric aberration, can uh, extend your depth of focus. And it also extends that in the hyperopic range, which gives you a lot of possibilities in terms of uh, combining both eyes uh, and doing a, a monovision uh, type of uh, approach, as you can see here. And as I said, without uh, diffracting or without shopping off the lights in different uh, um, parts, uh, you really have no dysphotopsia, which is nowadays one of the key features uh, for patient satisfaction, actually. So you see here <clears throat> the effect of the positive spherical operation. You see the depth of field. Uh, and this goes here from like plus one almost to uh, minus one and a half. So if we say we extend the depth of field to 1.5 diopter, it's not entirely true because we also have a part here, which gives you certain uh, advantages also in terms of uh, hitting the landing zone, being exact uh, on target, and also combining, as I said, this with, a, with the second eye in order of monovision uh, approaches. Here is the monovision approach. So you combine two uh, eyes, first and second eye. And with this, you get up into uh, the real interesting area of, over the uh, function of vision going to 2.5, 2.25 diopters of near vision. And uh, as I said, it's, a, it's, it's enough just to go for one diopter of uh, um, monovision to get to almost 2.5 diopters of depth of focus. So this is very, uh, very good, and the patient is almost not really re perceiving the distance between the two eyes. We check that in the laboratory in the David Apple lab here with the optical bench, and uh, uh, look also here at the binocular uh, distribution. You see we're getting here in the area of two, two and a half diopters, and it also depends a little bit on the uh, basic power of the lens. The difference if you have a 10 diopter lens or a lens which is like uh, 25 diopters. So with emetropia, you can easily promise a patient that he has good distance security and, let's say, computer vision or desktop vision. Uh, uh, with both eyes together, he will have even a little bit more than uh, just normal uh, computer or desktop vision, maybe a little bit uh, also laptop and stuff like this. If you do one diopter of monovision, then you get in the reading area and fairly good, actually, in these patients. They are very happy with that. 
Here you see a typical example of, of a patient from mine. Uh, you see that the depth of focus in the myopic range is here up to uh, 1.75, and in the other range also 1.5 diopter. So we have a pretty uh, long range of vision here. One is at the 0.1 Lokma level, uh, so 0.8, or at 0.63, it's this level here. So we get pretty far here, and it's understandable that this patient, which is like a minus one monovision here, as you see, uh, was ending up binocularly with very good good outcome. Uh, even the uncorrected near visual acuity binocularly was almost at 1.0, so 0.8. Uh, and for reading a newspaper, you'll need 0 0.4, 0 0.3 uh, decimal. You can see here uh, over time how the patient adapts. You see the three months, six months uh, uh, defocus curve uh, on this patient, and the patient gets out of this very nicely. So let's look now at a case with a toric uh, uh, patient, and here we targeted for uh, amitropia, actually. In this case, if you want, you can also read uh, here at the cataract and refractive surgery today uh, a supplementary which comes out uh, fairly soon. So this was a 64-year-old uh, patient. You see here the visual acuity uh, beforehand, uh, before the surgery, and you could see also she had a, a astigmatism here. It was slightly myopic. Here's uh, IOL master uh, data. Uh, a pretty normal case, so to say. Nothing really uh, special. Um, you, you can use the Ray-1 toric uh, calculator uh, for this, the ray trace. And this is what, what we calculated. Uh, <clears throat> it's 18.75 diopter with 1.5 diopter of astigmatism and uh, uh, 18.6 to 0.75 again here. Uh, so 19.5 uh, 19 diopter. And this was done here with the uh, Zeiss Anveo microscope. You can see we even uh, did a very nice capsulotomy to make everything perfect in this case and put the lens in. And then the very first day, we had an uh, excellent outcome for the distance, minus 0.04 LOCMA on the right eye and zero LOCMA on the other eye. Um, as you can see here, then at one week post-op, we had uncorrected distance visual acuity of minus 0.2, uh, in, uh, intermediate uh, 0.04, and near acuity of 0.2. And after one month, that actually increased, uh, especially in the near, to almost zero LOCMA. After three months, uh, uh, again, a very good outcome. And six months now, we are around uh, yeah, minus 0 0.24 uh, binocular distance and zero LOCMA for, for the intermediate and for the near. So excellent outcome. Uh, and this is not even with monovision. This was just a, a metropic refraction. So we were very impressed by this case and now have continued to use the EMV toric uh, uh, for a couple of other patients with very similar outcome. You see here also the defocus curve. And on the zero LOCMA level, uh, we are almost at uh, two and a half diopters. And 0 0.1, 0 0.2, you get up to four diopters of defocus uh, out of this whole uh, curve here. So that's very, very interesting. And the patient itself, you can see here very nicely the stability uh, of the markings of, of the lens uh, and also very good uh, clear posterior capsule. So the patient is very happy, has no, f no halos, nothing. So it's very nice actually. So conclusion, the Ray-1 uh, EMV and the toric version gives you an increased range of uh, focus, let's say around 1.5 diopter if you use uh, metropia. If you go further uh, on your monovision approaches, you can extend that. Uh, it's a very good uh, uh, platform because also of its very good uh, rotational stability and also the centration is excellent with, with this kind of design. And uh, the calculation, I think, is very good uh, with, the, with the tool that has been offered. We don't use uh, alternative tools for that. We use a, the Rayner uh, calculator for this. And as I said, this was the very first patient in, in Germany, and this was an excellent visual outcome and a really success story. So, but we, of course, have to do some more uh, numbers and long-term follow-up, but we are very enthusiastic now about this uh, possibility of having the EMV as a toric version. So thank you very much for your attention. Doctor, Doctor Ophan, do you use the same indications for toric uh, lenses that you use for trifocal or? or conventional monofocal lenses, or you have different thresholds for the preoperative astigmatism? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty uh, uh, obsessive with the astigmatism, so uh, I'd rather like to have a post-operative visual uh, astigmatism of less than three quarters of a diopter. Yeah, this is so my, my, my target. Yeah. One diopter is, is still too high, I think, uh, if you want a target for uh, a premium vision, let's put it this way. Yeah. Uh, so between uh, half a diopter and 0.75, that would be the maximum I would like to have with premium lenses, and this includes also the Rayner uh, uh, EMV. I know that there is a, a, a kind of a refractive tolerability with these lenses, yeah, and that you will also have good distance acuity and intermediate acuity if you still have one diopter of astigmatism left. Mm -hmm. But if you want to go beyond that, like in this patient, where you really get like minus 0.2 or something, this is exceptional for, for uh, this kind of, of uh, cataract patients, uh, then you really have to go to zero, more or less. Yeah? And uh, I think this is, uh, this is doable nowadays. So we can, we can try for it. This is not, not a problem if you don't reach it, but we can try to hit this target. Any question? Yeah. For all the fans, when you are dealing with a PCO in that type of a, a patient, how many rings do you think is enough to, to clean? So the size of the post yes. uh, uh, opening, you yes. mean? I usually do on diffractive lenses something like three to four millimeters, yeah, which is actually not normal pupil size that you have in that age group, and that is sufficient. Yeah, so uh, you don't need to make a very big one. Interesting is always to see what has the first impact, near or intermediate or distance acuity on, on, the, on the PCO, because sometimes people can see very good in the distance, but they complain about the near. Uh, but as I said, if you slightly bigger than the normal pupil size, I think it's, it's okay. I don't know what, what the other thing. I think also the pupil, pupil size is, uh, is the mandatory uh, item regarding the size of the of the yeah, I agree. I never count the rings, but yeah. we normally aim for about four millimeters. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, definitely, you don't want to go too large to put any instability on the peripheral capsule yeah. and the stability of the lens. Okay, can I add something to that? One thing compared to like uh, plate haptic lenses, which is not a danger, is that the lens will skip down. Because once you reach the uh, PCO thing, uh, in these closed haptics, you have already some ingrowth of uh, lens epithelial cells. So the lens is very safe. Even if you do a five millimeter capsulotomy, uh, it won't be dropping down because it's already baked into uh, the summer ring spring. In the, loop. in the loops, yeah. Okay, any question? Thank you very much, speakers, and finish the, the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.